Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey dudes, how you doing? Today's video is going to be on one of the scariest guests that Dr. Phil has ever had on his show. A 15 year old boy named Zachary Davis who murdered his mother with a sledgehammer while she slept in her bed. We're starting with a bang. We're starting heavy here today. But before we get started, if you're new, first off, welcome. Second, Please join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out new videos every week, morbid makeup all the time, where I put on a face of makeup while telling you a true crime story, and it's a really good time here. People seem to like it, and I would love it if you would join us and hang out and join the Brat Pack. Do it. Do it. So, the case we're covering today, the Zachary Davis case, I came across it because I was floating around on Facebook. I'm in a bunch of Facebook true crime and horror groups so I can keep up with what's going on and just like discuss it because that's what I'm into. And while I was floating around, somebody posted a clip from the Dr. Phil interview with Zachary Davis. And I was like, oh, and I started looking under it and like reading the comments and a lot of people were like, ah, oh, this boy seems like he's demonically possessed. And I was like, you had me at possessed. So I clicked it and I watched it. And after watching the clip, I was like, oh, I now need to know every single thing about this boy and this case and his mom and his life and everything, right? So I started looking online, trying to find information, went to YouTube, and I found there are pretty much no videos dedicated to this case from any of the people that I typically watch or many in general, like finding information, watching it. I was like, oh, well, if it doesn't exist, I'm going to put it out in the world. I'm going to put out into the world what I would like to watch and what I'd like to find. So hence this video. So you may notice, by the way, if you're not new, that uh, I already have makeup on now. I already filmed this and then I accidentally deleted the first clip. So we're gonna have a weird transition in the middle where I go from this to like no makeup on and do this whole look for you, but I accidentally deleted part, the, the first clip of this video. So that's why I have it on right now, but you're still gonna see the application process. We're just gonna have a little transition. Shouldn't be too jarring or weird, hopefully, fingers crossed, because boy, it's stressful messing up. If you saw my Jeepers Creepers video, you know that sometimes I fail. And here we are. And hopefully you still like it. So buckle in kids and let me tell you the story of 15 year old Zachary Davis who beat his mother to death with a sledgehammer while she slept. So our story begins with a woman named Melanie. Melanie was an Australian born woman who moved to the US where she met and married a man named Chris Davis. The couple would then go on to have two babies, two little boys. The first a boy named named, well he wasn't named Joshua, they named him Joshua, and then a year later a bouncing baby boy named Zachary Davis who was born July 27th 1997 making him a Leo. And he is uh, the topic of discussion today. He will him and Melanie. So there isn't a ton of information on the early years of the couple or the boys when they were really little how their lives were. All I was able to find is that the family did build a home for themselves in Kentucky um, and that's where they lived up until, you know, when the events start rolling, which is where we're headed right now. We're going to jump in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to when their lives changed forever in 2007. So 2007, the family's living in Kentucky. Zach is about nine to 10 years old and tragically his father passes away from Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, I had heard of this disease, obviously, but I wasn't really familiar with what it does in the body and like what kind of disease it is. So essentially I looked it up and it is a disease that attacks the muscle cells, I believe, or the nerves in the muscles, and it essentially makes your muscles deteriorate until, you know, you can't really move anymore. So it sounds like a pretty awful way for any person to die. And it seems like a pretty gnarly thing for Melanie to have to watch her husband go through and for Zach and Josh to have to watch their father suffer from until he inevitably died. So this was really hard on the family altogether. All of the family suffered obviously from losing their father and Chris, Melanie's husband, but Zach seemed to be suffering a little bit differently than the rest of the family. So he ended up actually getting put into therapy to see if what he was going through was a normal grieving situation or if there was something more they needed to worry about. While in therapy, it was found that while some of the things that Zach was going through were normal, like he had depression, obviously he had just lost his father, but not everything he was going through was a normal, thing that a person grieving goes through. Zach was hearing disembodied voices, particularly the disembodied voice of his late father. And that is not normal. So after evaluating him, the therapist determined that he was suffering from schizophrenia and a depressive disorder. That was what the doctor thought was going on. Now, for some reason, and I couldn't find the reason online, and I don't know if the reason really matters, but 
Melanie pulled Zach out of therapy and he didn't continue receiving the help that he might have needed. And this could be problematic because Zach was having such a hard time, not just with like the schizophrenia, but also with grieving for his father. You know, he had gone through the numb stage and the depressive stage, and that's kind of where he was at. And she pulled him out before they worked through recovery. So he was still suffering and hadn't come to terms with what was happening and was still in that depressive numb state. But you know, Melanie was determined to get over the loss of her husband and put together like the shattered pieces of, the, of her life. You know, everything she had had, everything she had planned for, when you lose someone, all of those plans are gone. So she wanted to do the best she could to put her life back together and give the best chance for her and for her kids. So she uprooted the family and they left their home in Kentucky to move to Summer County, Tennessee, and had hopes of, you know, having a fresh start and putting the life back together and finding some sort of happiness. But unfortunately she wasn't aware of just how bad her son was doing and that he was truly, truly unwell. And now we're gonna quickly transition. So Melanie, now a single mother of two teenage boys was doing the best she could to balance being a good mother and also being the sole provider for her family. She was going to work and doing her job as a paralegal, but also trying to make sure she had something for herself because I feel, and this is just my opinion, but I feel like it's really common for women in particular to kind of lose their identity once they have children and go from being, you know, Melanie the woman to Melanie the mother, Melanie the, the mama, the mama bear, right? So she took up running as a hobby for herself and like trained for triathlons and things like that. But she was now the sole parent, the sole provider, the only person who had to deal with all of this on top of the fact that she had just lost her husband, uh, likely the love of her life. And I uh, can't even imagine what that's like. Like my husband is my in entire world. So I can't even imagine how hard that would be to have to just be like, okay, let me, let me t put, keep myself together for these kids, which I know you have to, but I don't know, I feel, I sympathize with Melanie a bit. So with all of that going on in Melanie's life, it's possible that the problems that Zach was having, just not that she wasn't paying attention, just that she had a lot going on and it wasn't noticed. She didn't notice that he was getting darker and more distant. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a list, or well, not like a list, I'm gonna tell you right now, the reasons that I found in reviewing this case and looking into it, the reasons that people see, okay, I'm not even speaking English right now. I'm gonna tell you right now the stuff that people say were clear signs that Zach was having a problem, all right? And I'm not saying that they're wrong, I'm just saying that these fall different on my ear, right? So, Zach wore the same hoodie every day. He had the hood, you know, pulled up over his head every single day, no matter if it was hot, cold, he had a hoodie on and he didn't have a lot of friends. He was really interested in like torture and serial killers. He had little apps on his phone for both of those subjects. He was really into violent video games. He really liked Stephen King and particularly, in particularly, in particular, he liked the story Misery, which side note is just a great story. Um, and scrolled across his notebook, it said, you can't spell slaughter without laughter. Okay, now, I know to some people that sounds like, whoa, red flags. But not to me, okay? And I mean, obviously with him, maybe these were red flags, but I don't think these are characteristics that you see these in your kid or in any kid or Melanie should have seen these and known better because to me, that just sounds like a normal angsty teenage emo boy, okay? That sounds like every friend that I had in high school. That sounds like me in high school to be honest, and I never killed anyone. I feel like there's a difficult line that you have to kind of dance around where it come, goes from normal teenage brooding bullshiv to an actual problem. And it's difficult, I would imagine, to see where that comes from, right? Because there's hormones and there's all that and you're like, okay, this is a phase, this is normal. And oftentimes it is. So, I don't know, I just feel like I don't know how I feel. It's hard to explain how I feel because to me, that just sounds like me. That sounds like me in high school. And I, you know, didn't kill anybody. So we're going to fast forward a little bit now to the day of the murder. Okay. So it's August 12th, 2012, a normal Thursday. Zach, his brother, Josh, and his mom had spent some time together, gone to the movies together and just had like a good day. And when they came home, 
Zach packed a bag. A weird bag. It contained Zach's notebooks, his diary, his toothbrush, clothing, a ski mask, gloves, a claw hammer. It looked like maybe Zach was planning to run away, but what he had in mind was much more morbid than that. So that night, Melanie went to bed around 9 p.m., hoping to get a good night's sleep, with no idea what her son, her baby, had in mind for her that night. About two hours after Melanie went to bed, her 15-year-old son, who we've been talking about, Zachary Davis, went into his family garage and retrieved a sledgehammer. He later said that he chose a sledgehammer specifically because he was less likely to miss with a sledgehammer. And people ask me why I don't have kids. <laughs> Zach then walked to his mother's room and he stood outside her bedroom door for a little bit, just standing there maybe. He says he wasn't thinking, but he hesitated before entering, just stood outside her door, kind of stared at it, waited. He says that once he entered her room, he stood over her bed and actually watched her sleep as well. He stood there and just kind of like watched her breathe, watched her sleep before he then raised the sledgehammer above his head to make sure he got enough speed and then beat his mother to death while she slept in her bed. He hit his mother in the head with a sledgehammer anywhere between 10 and 20 times, somewhere in that range, um, making sure to lift it above his head to bring it down with as much force as possible with each swing. He said that at one point she woke up after being hit and started to seize. He said that he looked into her eyes, but she did not look back at him. He said that at some point during the attack, he placed a pillow over his mother's face because he didn't like the gurgling sounds she was making. Oh, and he was also worried that, he, that the sound of her dying would wake up his older brother. He then left his mother's room covered in blood, as I'm sure you can imagine, and he locked her bedroom door behind him. After leaving his mother's room, Zach then went downstairs to his family game room that his family had, and he covered it in whiskey and gasoline, and then set the room on fire, hoping to destroy all evidence and kill his brother who was sleeping upstairs all in one fell swoop. Zach then fled the house, grabbing his bags that he had packed earlier that night on his way out, and just started running on foot, throwing his cell phone in a ditch on his way from fleeing his burning home. So fortunately for Zach's older brother, Josh, when Zach was done setting the game room on fire, he actually closed the, the door. He pulled the door closed, which stopped the fire from spreading as much as I'm sure Zach was hoping it would. And Josh ended up being woken up by the fire alarm. So he got out of bed and he ran to his mother's room to be like, mom, mom, we got to go. The house is on fire. And when he got there, he found that the door was locked. So when Josh starts banging on the door and Melanie doesn't answer, Josh decides to break down the door. That's when he came upon what I'm sure was just a traumatizing sight. So he ran, he left the house, he ran to a neighbor's house and he called the police. So even though Zach had ran off, it didn't take police long to find him. Five hours after coming upon the house, they found Zach less than 10 miles away and he quickly confessed and was arrested. And when asked, you know, when questioned, he said he felt nothing when he killed his mother. Zach said, that the voice of his dead father had told him to kill his mother and that he had no regrets at all. And if he could go back, not only would he still kill his mother, but he would have taken the sledgehammer to his brother as well, since the fire had not gotten the job done. And that's what was so scary about Zach is he showed no remorse. Even when they showed him photos of his dead mother, nothing, no response. He, he didn't care. So while in jail waiting for, for his trial, that's when Zach ended up being interviewed by Dr. Phil. And that's those clips of that interview is how I first heard about this case in the first place. I had heard nothing of this case prior to seeing those clips because it, it's just not very talked about, which is weird because it's pretty gnarly. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like this is one that people would talk about a lot, but I don't know, maybe it's just me. So apparently this interview happened about two months before his actual trial. And you should watch this interview if you can find it. I couldn't find the whole interview on 
YouTube, um, but you can find clips and this kid's a little terrifying. <laughs> He's a little terrifying, you guys. He made the hair on my arms kind of stand on end and I'm not like an easily spooked person. I am like kind of a creepy bitch and that kind of stuff doesn't scare me, but something about his demeanor, the way he smiles, the way he like nods, the way he speaks, the way his voice sounds, scared the shit out of me a little bit. Made me wildly uncomfortable. He just really doesn't seem to feel bad, right? So when he's talking about the sound that the sledgehammer hitting his mother's skull sounded like, he kind of like laughs to himself like a psychopath would do. And when Dr. Phil asked him like, why'd you kill your mom? His only response was just, she wasn't taking care of me and the family. That was it, that's his reasoning. And he was tired of it. And Dr. Phil asked him like, okay, so she wasn't taking care of the family, you were upset, got it. What made this day the day? Like what about this day made you think, okay, this is the day I'm gonna kill her? Cause he said he decided he was gonna kill her the day that he did it. So he hadn't like planned it in advance, supposedly. He decided the day he was gonna do it. So Dr. Phil was like, what about that day made it the day? What happened? Was there an altercation? Like what was it? And he said, nothing. It just seemed like a good day to do it. And that is so unsettling to me. Just the randomness of it and just the like, I don't know, woke up and it seemed like a good day to kill my mom, you know? And it's just, I don't know. And anyway, this, uh, this interview was shown to the jury at Zach's trial two months later, which I'm sure just made him look as wonderful as you would imagine. And another thing that was super weird about this case is that like people who knew the family said that Zach and his mom were close, that they got along, that there weren't issues in the family. Even when the police checked his phone, they checked his phone for like messages after he was arrested. Days leading up to the murder, him and his mom were like sending nice messages back and forth. There was nothing that would make them think that he was planning to kill her or wanted to kill her or had those feelings inside of him. So it took a bit after the murders for the case to actually go to trial, but once it did go to trial, Zach was tried as an adult and he pled not guilty due to insanity. So the defense tried to say that Zach was too mentally ill to have consciously planned the murders and for them to be premeditated. Um, Zach's grandma, I believe on his father's side, testified saying that he wasn't an evil boy, he was a mentally ill boy that didn't get the help he needed and that, you know, he had just made a terrible mistake. And even the therapist that Zach had first been, you know, meeting with when his dad had first died, the therapist uh, even testified saying that Zach was psychotic and that that drove his actions and made what happened happen. But the prosecution argued that even if he was mentally ill, because I don't think anyone's disputing that this kid m might be crazy, right? But even if he was, he still planned the attack. He knew it was wrong and he premeditated, premeditatedly planned it. I know that that's not right, but you know what I mean, that he knew to pack a bag so that he could run. He knew to get rid of his cell phone on the way out to stop him from being caught. He chose the sledgehammer specifically over other murder weapons because he knew it would get the job done. And Zach's diary ended up being admitted into evidence and there were lots of passages in there about Zach planning to kill his mother. So it wasn't as random as he wanted it to seem or as the defense was saying that it was. And inside Zach's diary, speaking of his diary, a possible motive was found. Inside Zach's diary, it said that his, first off, okay, wait, I just wanna say this, okay. Inside Zach's diary, it said that his older brother, Josh, had raped him and that he had told his mother and that his mother didn't believe him. It also said in his diary that, like after the murders he had written, that he, his only regret is that he hadn't killed his mother faster because he didn't want her to suffer, but that he did want Josh to suffer, which is why he was going to burn him alive, essentially. But his brother got on the stand and of course denied this and people who knew the family and knew them as a whole said that they didn't actually believe that that was true, that, th that Josh, you know, picked on his younger brother, but that they never believed that that would have happened. And it was never proven just for clarity there. Cause I don't want anybody, I don't know. I don't think anyone, I got nice people. I don't think you guys are going to be like, Oh, rapist brother. But you know, it was never proven. So keep that in mind. So in addition to like, 
that not being proven and another reason we could I mean I'm not gonna say it didn't happen because we don't know but another thing that kind of shot his credibility and made people not really trust what Zach was saying is that he contradicted himself a ton during the case not only did he give a totally different motive in the Dr. Phil interview which the jury was shown and he you know nodded and laughed at inappropriate times during his trial. He actually ended up completely like bamboozling his attorney in the middle of the trial without like, okay, so he ended up being put on the stand to be questioned. And when being put on the stand, he changed his story completely. and was like, just kidding. I didn't actually kill my mom. My brother did it. My brother did it all. I didn't do anything. And to be honest, that whole trial just sounds like such a shit show to me. Can you imagine being that kid's attorney and putting him on the stand to like say what happened and him just being like, oh yeah, like, I didn't do it. Maybe he thought this would make him seem more crazy, but it just made nobody believe the stuff that he said. In the end, after just three hours of deliberation, the jury did find Zach guilty and he was given life in prison. The judge said, telling Zach, you became evil, Mr. Davis. You went to the dark side. It's that plain and simple. So Zach has to do a minimum of 70 or 71 years in prison because, okay, so the way I understand Tennessee law, because I did look into this, is that a life sentence is 60 years and they have to do a minimum of 51 years before they're eligible for parole. But that was just for, that was just the sentence for murdering his mother. For the attempted murder on his brother, he was given an additional 20 years. So that adds to the 70 or 71. So it's safe to say that Zach will always be in prison because he's 15, probably like 17 by the time he was actually put into jail and he has to be there for 70 years. By the time he got out, he's going to be well into his 80s. So he's going to spend his whole life behind bars because at only 15 years old, he did the unthinkable and the unforgivable and the unexcusable. And that, my friends, is the story of 15 year old Zachary Davis, the boy who gave one of the scariest interviews with Dr. Phil of all time. I went into a freaking hole with this case, man, reading threads and articles and comments and like everything anyone was saying I was reading. A lot of people think that this kid was clearly too mentally ill to have been found guilty of this murder. The way he talks, the weird nod, the how disconnected he was from everything would be evidence of that but there's a small group of people who see those same pieces of evidence as a sign that this teenage boy is demonically possessed because mostly because of the way he talks, which is so you've got to watch. You've got to watch. I will link down below some clips of the interview. The way he speaks is honestly very creepy. And I can understand how, why somebody would hear that and be like, Oh yeah, there's a, there's a demon in that boy because it's honestly very scary the way he talks. And I remember I, uh, I was looking in threads and I found the thread from somebody who claimed, I, I can't say for sure this person knew him, but claimed to have gone to high school with him. And they said that the way he was talking in that interview is not the way he spoke in school. So, I mean, I'm not saying I believe in demonic possession or anything. I will leave that up in the air forever. and You'll never know what I believe in. But the facts are pretty clear. He did do it. He did plan it. And he did try to cover it up. And based on our laws, on what guilty by reason of insanity are, he is therefore guilty under our rules. Now, should our rules maybe change on that? I'll leave that up to you because there's some cases that I'm like, well, but that person was obviously crazy, but the planning, the covering up, that makes it so you knew it was wrong, which means you cannot get off on the insanity. But I'll leave that for a discussion in the comments because I know there are a lot of opinions there. It's just, it's really sad, you know? I feel, I do feel like this, this kid could have benefited from continued therapy, but who knows why he was pulled out? You know, we don't know the reasoning there. We weren't raising him, we weren't his mother. It's really easy to sit there and be like, oh, this is, you know, her fault because if she had just let him get continued therapy, blah, 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 he clearly needed it. But I mean, you weren't there, you know? And you, you don't know what she saw and you don't know how he was with her. And I'm, sh I'm sure if she knew it was this bad, something would have happened because obviously she didn't want this, she didn't want this to happen. You know what I mean? Maybe she couldn't afford it. Therapists are incredibly expensive and mental health is one of those sticky things where it's just extremely complicated, especially in our country. Being able to get mental health care is a, is a, is sadly, a blessing and I imagine she had no idea how bad off he was which I've already said but I just feel like I need to drill that in because I, I get comments of people victim blaming and it's like 
bro, I get it. Like, oh, she should have known. But, like, you don't know what the family was like. And I'm sure if she had known, she would have gotten him help. Because I got the impression that she loved her kids. And that she wanted them to do the best that they could. So it's not like she was just like, oh, suffer, little boy. Or maybe, I, I don't know her, you know? And neither do you. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make here. It's just a really unfortunate series of events that ended with a woman losing her life and a boy being in jail for the rest of his. So, in effect, losing his life as well, just, you know, less aggressively. But I am really curious as to what you guys have to say with this one. Just, of course, please be respectful. The victim blaming comments, just please, you know, because... Ugh. But with that said, I am interested in what you have to say, just in a respectful way. Did you see the interview clips? If you haven't, please check that link down below and go watch it, because... I just really want to discuss his demeanor and the way he speaks and the way he pauses and how creepy he is because it's clear to me why this is listed as one of Dr. Phil's scariest interviews because kids scary. Scary kid. Scary kids scaring kids. But anyways guys, that completes this video. I hope it was informative and interesting and gave you anything you could want from this specific case and hopefully I introduced you to a new case. Of course, Join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out new morbid makeup videos every week. And let me know down below of any cases you'd like to see me cover because I have an ongoing list of things that I want to cover. But of course, I would love to know what you're interested in because you have really great ideas and really great taste. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And with all of that said, thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. You are tight. This is tight. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.